Um, so social media is all about relationships, um, but relationships are what drives business. And it's relationships that is what makes publishing tick. And I think we're all familiar with the key relationships in the bricks and mortar model of the publishing world. Um, these relationships were fairly linear. And for most publishers, the key relationships really were with distributors and with retailers. Now, for readers, the key relationship was with the retailer, um, the bookshop, because that's where they got their recommendations from. It was the retailer that offered deals, that rewarded loyalty. In the internet era, um, the model is basically the same. Uh, some of the names have changed. The um, aforementioned gorilla shows up. But in this era, the reader has no relationship with the retailer anymore. There's no human contact. Um, all the recommendations are algorithmic. There's no conversation. And more to the point, there's no possibility of conversation. Um, you cannot email uh, Amazon and have a nice chat with uh, uh, a customer service person about what books they recommend next, because all of that has been automated. So this means there's a huge opportunity now, because in the online world, the reader is kind of slightly bereft. They're a bit at sea at the moment. So there's an opportunity for publishers to start creating relationships directly with readers not just to broadcast at them through websites and, and publicity drives, but, but to really engage and to listen and to learn about the needs and the desires of the readers. And I think in this digital age, publishers have a lot of opportunities. And this is, in, for my money, the most important one. Because if you can build relationships, then you can build trust. And if you build trust, you build loyalty. And when you have those in place, you can start to sell directly to your readers. Okay. So why might you, as a publisher, want to sell direct? If you're a niche publisher, then direct sales become really an important way to reach a niche audience. For example, in the UK, uh, we have Osprey Publishing. Now, these are a, a military history specialists. Um, they struggle to, to get that much shelf space. Bookstores are small, and niche interests tend to be um, sidelined. Um, so direct sales expands their reach. It expands the, the number of people that can buy from them. And it makes it easier for readers to find new books. Because it's a niche interest, there's a huge opportunity for Osprey to start to form relationships with their readers. Um, specialist readers tend to be passionate readers. So that means uh, it's relatively easy to either create a community or plug into a community of interest that already exists. So uh, Osprey has a blog. They have a discussion forum where people can talk not just about the books, but also about military history in general. Um, and so the publisher's website becomes a destination for anybody who's interested in military history. So it becomes more than just about, here are some books, please buy them. It's about, here is a conversation about stuff you love. Come and join in. A second reason to start thinking about direct sales is to diversify products. Um, and particularly, uh, products that are good for this are, are special editions or bundles, which are difficult to sell through Amazon or through um, uh, traditional retailers. So one example of a, uh, a luxury special edition is uh, the 2011 um, book by Jeffrey Deaver, which was a James, Bod James Bond novel called Carte Blanche. This was a really special edition. Um, this was Hodder and Staunton working with Opus and the car manufacturer Bentley. Um, and they designed this, it's a uh, Nappa leather handbound, comes in a brushed steel box uh, shaped like a Bentley Continental GT. Um, whatever that is. 
<laughs> because you have this community of, uh, in fact, you have two communities, obviously the Bentley community, but also the James Bond community. And these were not cheap um, books. These were a thousand pounds each, and the print run was one uh, was five hundred copies. So if you didn't have your thousand big ones and you didn't get in early enough, tough. But the thing is, James Bond fans are passionate, and they are likely to spend that kind of money on something that is that exclusive. But more than that, this special edition created quite a lot of buzz around the book itself. So um, there were articles online, not just about um, a book review of the, the book or, or um, the sort of normal activity that you would expect from a new release of such a big franchise, but there's a lot of discussion of the special edition as well. And in car forums and, and car websites, not just book websites. So this, it creates buzz and it encourages the fans to pay attention to what you might do next, because if they missed out on that, they certainly aren't going to miss out on the next one. Selling Direct also allows bundling of different products together, and particularly ebooks and physical books. Um, Angry Robots is a small uh, sci-fi and fantasy imprint in the UK, um, also a part of Osprey. And what they've started is a project called The Clone Files. So whenever a reader buys a physical book in one of a number of independent bookstores, um, they can hand over their email address, tell the bookstore which format they prefer, and they will be personally emailed a copy of the ebook to go along with the physical book. So this has proven to be really popular because people, it turns out, want to choose where and how they read. They might want to read the paper book at home, but as soon as they start their morning commute, they want the ebook because they don't want to carry the paper book around. In fact, this has turned out to be so popular that since Angry Robots started this scheme, they have tripled their sales, um, which I think is, uh, it was an experiment. They weren't sure how it was going to go, and I think it's certainly proven its worth. The ability to sell direct and form these relationships with your readers also gives the opportunity to diversify your revenue streams. Because books aren't just about the physical books or the e-books. There are other ways of getting people to give you money. Um, another example from Osprey is uh, they offer a membership package. So you get 30% off the books. Um, you get free e-books. But you also get access to a members area, which has a whole load of specialist material that, as a military history enthusiast, you are probably interested in. So profiles of military planes, of weapons, military equipment, maps of battles and campaigns. They've even actually taken the artwork from the books and made that available as well. So they're repurposing their print assets in the digital world, but you have to pay for it. So it's pretty affordable, £7.50 a month or £81 annually. So it's quite an inclusive um, opportunity. Pretty, this is not the James Bond Bentley edition. Um, Angry Robot, again, have done something very similar. You can subscribe to their e-books. So you can get a six-month or a 12-month subscription. Um, the six-month subscription, you get at least 12 books. And if you take the year subscription, you get at least 24. But you will get everything they put out over that period. So if they produce more, you get more. Now, one of the interesting things about subscriptions is that it smooths out the income over the year. So you're not getting... Uh, not so uh, uh, prone to peaks and troughs as books are released and then die away. So that makes financial planning easier. Um, but what you also get is a commitment from the buyer. You don't have to persuade them each book at a time to say, buy this ebook, buy that ebook. If you give them a discount, they will reward you with uh, a commitment and a consistency. And they will almost certainly buy more books through a subscription than they would if they were doing it book by book. Now, the, fine, uh, the fourth 
uh, reason to, to go direct is about market testing and managing very short runs. So pre-orders for special editions uh, really give you an opportunity to, to see exactly uh, how popular an idea is. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why Kickstarter and crowdfunding platforms are proving really popular, because it provides a limit. You, you give people a, a date by which they need to sign up, and once that date has passed, you know what your print run's going to be. But there's also about managing very, very short runs. So Corey Doctorow uh, wrote a book called With a Little Help, uh, and he produced a number of editions, uh, ebook, uh, printed through Lulu, so uh, paperback, but also this very nice uh, hand-bound uh, hardback. Now, not only did he discover that the luxury edition, uh, this was £182, roughly, um, that that was more popular than the paperback, it also allowed him to manage his ordering. So he only does these in batches of 20, which means that he controls his inventory and he minimizes the risk that would come with doing a large uh, order up front and then trying to sell that on. And finally, um, gathering reader data. We've heard an awful lot about data today, and I think that reflects just how important it is. Um, the internet is awash with data, but a lot of that data is impossible to access. And for publishers, there's a lot of data that you can't access if you don't control your point of sale. Amazon, for example, has vast quantities of data that it doesn't share. So how many people visit a given books page on Amazon? That tells you, if you have that information, how well is your publicity work going? How attractive is the book? How many people bought the book? Because it's not just about discovery and understanding that the book is there. There's also that next step in the purchase cycle, which is the decision to buy. So are you hooking people in with your book description? If you change your book description, does that have an impact on how many people buy? Referrals are incredibly important bits of data. Where are people coming from? How are your different PR channels and communication channels um, behaving? How are they performing compared to one another? So are more people coming from Twitter than from Facebook? Should you spend more time blogging? Are people searching for your book by name or are they just stumbling across it? More data that Amazon doesn't really tell you. How important are reviews to that purchase decision? Um, as someone who's very interested in self-publishing, we are bombarded with the message that we ought to be getting reviews all the time. But it turns out that about half of purchases on Amazon are pre-planned. They're not coming from reviews. So if you know who's read your reviews, and whether they then go on to buy or to not buy, then that gives you some idea of how important reviews are to your books. Um, dwell time. Do people who spend longer on your book's page buy it or not buy it? And if they spend longer on your page and go on to buy, then how can you hook them in? How can you give them more content to read? How can you create a relationship on that sales page? And where do they go next? What do they do when they leave your books page? Um, do they go to another similar book? Do they go to a competitor's book, a completely different book? That, again, tells you a little bit about what they're thinking when they're actually looking at your book, whether they are um, dissatisfied enough to look for something similar or whether they've actually just you know, changed their mind and, and gone in a completely different direction. So this kind of data, which Amazon has, and it uses all the time, but which is very, uh, well, pretty much impossible to get, is essential to understanding um, the psychographics of your online buyer. It's not just about their demographics, how old they are, what income level they are. It's about the psychographics. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? Uh, how do they make decisions? And this kind of data also helps you really quantify the success of different 
marketing strategies, um, and in particular, different social media strategies. Because there is so much that you could be doing with social media, but you need to really focus on the stuff that's going to work, that is going to increase sales, because that's what we're doing it for. Um, and you can also use this kind of data to test author bios, um, test book descriptions, test the kind of information you're giving out. Um, and actually refining that. I mean, there are whole positions now at newspaper just for uh, people who understand how to refine headlines. And you know, lots of newspapers A, B test headlines. And we should be doing the same with books. So building relationships um, is a key part, as I've said, of this whole um, future of direct sales. Um, social networks understand your target audience, understand where they are, which tools they're using, and go there. Um, you don't have to be everywhere. You have to be where your audience is. Blogs often are uh, underutilized these days. I think they've become a bit not cool. Um, blogs should really be your central hub. You have your website, but a blog allows you to talk at length with your audience, with your readers, and allows them to leave comments and talk back. Mailing lists, really old school, but really important, um, and I think often overlooked because, um, because they are such a, a sort of standard thing to do. But tools like MailChimp allow for really sophisticated use of mailing lists. So you can have one list which is very heavily segmented, which makes sure that you can target recipients with exactly the information they want. So it becomes much less about a scattershot broadcast and much more about something highly focused. Forums, also very old school, but also very useful when done well. And when curated well, they do need a, a lot of care and attention. They're, they're like a little delicate plot, potted plant that needs just the right amount of water. Um, but a forum is a good way for your readers to get to know each other and to create a genuine community because we often talk about a community of readers, but they're not a community until they know who each other is. Until then, they're just a constituency. And friends of you, who are the bloggers and the writers that are passionate about what you're doing, the books that you're producing? Um, again, to go back to uh, Angry Robot, um, they have the Robot Army which is a collection of reviewers, journalists, critics, booksellers, librarians. And what they do is these people sign up and they get access to authors for interviews, they get books for review, they get exclusive content. So this is a way of um, Angry Robot making sure that they keep their community of friends happy. You need to make sure that the people who will be spreading the word about your books have everything they need, and that, that's what this is about. So um, a quick look at some of the sales tools. Obviously, um, some, uh, some companies will end up with a bespoke tool. Angry Robot used a bespoke direct sales tool because uh, there wasn't anything on the market at the time. They started this two years ago. Um, but bespoke is slow to develop, it's expensive, it needs maintenance, uh, it needs constant updating. So although the, uh, the, the sort of lure of bespoke is we'll make it special and we'll make it exactly what we want, the cost to that is that it is more expensive and it is more time consuming. So there are some, a couple of third party tools I want to um, quickly show you. Moving to a third-party tool shifts the cost of development. It means you don't need to have the in-house expertise. Um, and these aren't the only tools that are around, but these are the two that I know best. Um, Ganksy, this is an American tool, uh, relatively new, creates showcases for books, and then uh, deals with both direct sales and links to online retailers. And I think it's worth emphasizing that going direct doesn't mean not using other sales channels. This is not about forsaking Amazon forever. This is about parallel um, sales channels that allow you to tap into a slightly different part of the market. 
Um, so Ganksy do promotions, they do money off vouchers, giveaways, you can create bundles, um, and you can collect your customer emails for your mailing list. Um, Publit, which you probably all know a lot better than I do, uh, and you have the advantage of speaking Swedish, which I don't, um, but again, integrated with uh, major booksellers, and they go a step further than Ganksy, um, so they've got their print-on-demand, uh, can do conversion for uh, from PDF to ebooks and print on demand, and they'll even scan your back catalogue for you, which I think is terribly generous of them. Um, so an example um, is uh, Harlequin, uh, and again you can see this kind of very much a familiar shop front feel. So this is really suited to um, the the idea of your publisher website as being a destination, not just um, a sort of corporate presence because you have to. The important thing as well about Ganksy and Publit is they both produce stats and analytics, which means you can start to delve down into what's really happening, what are, what's your reader behavior, what are they actually doing, which means you can start to hypothesize and test your hypothesis and, and start thinking about if we do this with our marketing, what effect is that going to have on sales? Because you can start to relate those two things directly, which when all you've got from Amazon is, sta is sales data, it becomes quite difficult to know whether it was the Twitter conversation or the Facebook conversation or the review that all happened on the same day that's responsible for your peak in sales. Whereas if you've got direct um, traffic information, you can tell which one of those three things did it. So what next? I, my advice to any publisher interested in this is to start off with the relationships. Start off figuring out where you're at with social media, how you can build relationships with your readers. Ask them what they want. Do they want ebook and physical book bundles? Do they want, um, say, to have a bundle of one author's series? Um, what is it that they will pay that little bit extra for or that, that they will actually commit to buying from you. Develop direct sales products. This isn't so much about taking uh, mass market products um, off Amazon or Barnes and & Noble and, and going direct with them. Um, and in actual fact, I think that uh, it's, it can be dangerous to try and cut out the traditional retailers um, there's an example from the uh, UK, and I will uh, refrain from naming the guilty parties, but one really big publisher took a major title and started selling it direct at a big discount. The indie bookstores saw this basically as a betrayal and started returning their copies of that book because they were being undercut by the publisher. So being careful that the products that you're offering for direct sale are suited for it. Third-party tools, reduce setup costs. That means you can pilot an experiment really simply and quickly and at a very low cost. You could all walk out of here tomorrow and start setting up Publit or Ganksy uh, accounts uh, and just kind of see where it goes. When the cost of experimentation is so low, you're really reducing the risk, and that means that you can really push it and, and, and kind of go to the edges of, of your comfort zone and try new things. And finally, assess and iterate. Um, any pilot, any experiment, you need to know what your goals are. What are you trying to achieve? Are you achieving it? What could you do to improve? So this really comes down to um, disrupt your own business model. Um, there's no doubt that disruption is coming. We've seen it in the UK and the, uh, uh, and the US. Um, in conversations I've had, I think Scandinavia hasn't quite been affected as much by Amazon, but they're almost certainly on their way. So you have this window of opportunity, um, and you can set up uh, direct sales, and you can experiment with these uh, ways of reaching your readers and, and creating these strong relationships with your readers um, at fairly low risk now. So that's me. Thank you very much.